All right, welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Raw Show podcast. Try to bring you humanity, sports, and today we are truly at the intersection of that. You know my love for college football doesn't get much bigger when you talk about Oregon football. And today we're bringing on former Oregon Duck, but also producer, writer, talent, actor, and he got to co-host. Uh, I'm lucky I get to co-host with him on the most recent show that I'm really proud of to be a part of called All American Stories. His name is Spencer Pacinger. He joins us now. Spencer, thanks for making the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. I mean, anytime, anytime you call, I'm I'm answering. So here we are. Yeah, you know what? I feel the same exact way um, from when we met. So I, I like doing this sometimes. Uh, I didn't anticipate doing it with you, but it kind of hit me to to ask it. What What's your recollection of the first time we met? And I'm gonna tell my recollection of the first time we met. Um, first time we met. I mean, before that, it was just it was just emails and and coordinating. Um, but the first time we like were physically in the same room, I think, or field, I would say, uh, it was just an instant connection. Uh, I felt like I felt like I knew you already. Uh, I felt like you understood, uh, you know, my history and just like the athletic mindset of how like whenever I'm talking, I'm always thinking about the next thing I'm about to say or whatever. Just like game planning in that aspect. I don't think athletes ever get away from that um but there was just a sense of ease between us that is actually rare in this industry um oftentimes when you when you meet somebody you kind of know within the first you know two or three minutes if they're positioning you to to try to use something you have or try to get a one-up on you but for us it just felt like just open honest dialogue yeah i'm with you there i think i've always felt this the the, the following phrase uh which is we all speak ball and that was the original title of the show that we pitched that is now titled All American Stories. The title of the pitch was We All Speak Ball. And the point of it was that no matter where you go, it could be another country, it could be the same city. I've always felt that you can play catch with somebody, whether it's with a legitimate ball or the proverbial ball in air quotes, and you can connect. And athletes can do that, you know, whether they've known each other or not. And that, that's what I felt. I was like, dude, yeah, this dude and I could talk ball and whatever ball means to us now, right? We look at our creative endeavors as sport, our artistic endeavors, our family endeavors, and of course, actual sport and play. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I felt. I was like, oh, heck yeah. And uh, my wife would clown me, but I'll say it anyway. She's always, I'm always like, dude, I met this guy. He's amazing. She's always like, man, all you want to meet is like one cool dude that you can talk to <laughs> all the time. And I, and, and I found you Spencer. So. We don't get that enough. Like whenever I talk sports or just, or just anything like that with my wife, she kind of rolls her eyes and I'm like, I need an outlet. Like I need, like, who can I talk to about this, about this kind of things? Totally, man. Totally. All right. So with that said, let's talk about a couple of things. Um, our show just premiered on the CW. We're recording this on January 12th. It premiered on the 11th on the CW and uh, it, it went right up against the college football championship game. Um, but f I want to know your experience with it. Uh, if you watch it in real time, or if you watch it after the game and then what your reaction to it was for you and, and what you even may have heard from, from family, friends, and eventually we'll get to fans. Yeah. So I've actually watched it twice since it aired. Uh, I watched it last night. Uh, I, I turned off the national championship after a certain point uh, and then watched it. And then this morning, um, while I was stretching and rolling out. I like to wake up before the whole house wakes up. So I put it on and watched it again. Um, and it was just such great stories. I, I, obviously I was part of the process and, and saw them before everybody, but you know, from, from scout story, uh, to just, I mean, everybody, it was, it kind of hit me all over again, how important these stories were telling. Um, are you know my my family reached out a lot of them watched it friends reached out people I hadn't talked to in years said that they were tuning in or, or were sharing it with their friends so I think it's overall it's been well received a big part of it for you and I um, from our first meeting was you know and I, I learned this as I was preparing to you know get to know you and then of course you know talk to you on set was there's not a ton out there about who you are right I think a lot of people think when they watch the show All American, which is based on your life, that Spencer James is Spencer Pacinger. We talked about that last night yes. on set a little bit. What was it like for for you to finally unearth some of the truths about your life and then watch that back? <laughs> uh, it was almost it was almost therapeutic uh, to a sense where you know even when we were developing All American, the show. Um, mining a lot of my history, a lot of my past and realizing that, you know, some things weren't uh, what they were. 
uh, you know, revisiting some good times and some bad times. So being able to share that openly and honestly on the show uh, was, was again, therapeutic. It was one of those things that, that made me realize like, oh, I have grown, um, you know, from one place to another. Uh, I think it was, uh, I think it again was, was, uh, I forget, was it Scout that said you can't get past something unless you're, you can't get past something unless you are past it, something like that. I'm, I might be messing it up if that was Scout or not. But it was just another reminder that um, I've had a pretty long road in my 32 years of life, but there's still so much more ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, watching it uh, for me last night, it was really cool to listen to you tell things that you hadn't told before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like super courageous of somebody, you know, like, again, it was the first time that we had met. We're in the middle of a football field with a crew around us. Um, that you, you don't know. And you know that people are seeking to know like some truths about you mm -hmm. and to, to be willing to go there. Do you feel as though because of the, the light that you're in right now, let alone the storyteller that you are, that it's your responsibility to share a little bit about who you are to maybe inspire somebody else who's got a long road as you just referenced? Yeah, absolutely. I think be, because I'm in this position uh, and because you know Spencer James is sort of this amalgamation of myself um, and his story will, will change and, and can be completely different from, from my upbringing from 17 years old on. Um, now that people are reaching out and wanting to know the real story behind you know, Spencer Pacinger as opposed to Spencer James, because yes, they can see the show and, and follow his story, but they wanna know where it came from. Uh, I do find a sense of, of, you know, of right in wanting to telling and wanting to tell my story. Um, not wanting to take anything away from all American. I think Spencer James at this point, and we will continue to mine stories of my past, but um, I do want people to understand that Spencer Pacinger had a whole life as well. Uh, although you are seeing Spencer James's life play out. Yeah, you, you say something, uh, and again, uh, all American season three will premiere on the 18th. And then the second episode of our special All American Stories will uh, come on February uh, 1st at nine o'clock, wherever that is you are, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, but you said something that really struck with me about Spencer James. You said, people want to see this young man as a character at like 17 and be like, we got him figured out. Yeah. But he's got this whole life ahead of him. Um, when you said that, I was like, I, I bet you think that way about yourself too. Did you feel like you were ever defined as like, oh, he's a linebacker in Oregon. I, I got him figured out. He came from Crenshaw and then he went to Beverly Hills. And yeah, I know Spencer Pacinger. Yeah. I, I mean, when it comes to getting to the levels that I reach in, in terms of collegiate and then NFL and then winning the Super Bowl at that, you know, a lot of people outside of my immediate family and friends, they'll look to me or they used to look to me and say, well, you won a Super Bowl, you you play in the NFL. Like, that's all she wrote. You, you did what you were supposed to do in life. And I'm looking at those same people like, well, I'm, I'm only, you know, 23, 24, 27, 28 years old. I haven't, hopefully I haven't lived, you know, all of my life so far. I still have another, you know, two thirds of my life to go. So um, whenever, whenever I hear those, it's, I, it's kind of fuel for me to just like keep going. Um, again, I'm only 32 years old and, and hopefully I have a long life ahead. So, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, football might be like way past in the, in the rearview mirror. I might, I, hopefully I will have accomplished uh, many more things. Have you ever thought about that? Like when it's all said and done, what are the things that you hope you stand for? You know, what's the first sentence your kids might say outside of, you know, dad really loved me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I base my entire life and trajectory off putting my kids in a better position than what I was. Uh, I even look at it now, the fact that they're able to grow up in, in the home that me and my wife have made for them, have the opportunities that will almost become second nature to them that we had to scrap and fight for growing up. Uh, if I can put my kids and then potentially my grandkids and you know maybe my great grandkids <laughs> in a better position and, and knowing that it didn't necessarily start with me, but I gave it the, the necessarily the necessary pump to go forward, then that's fine. Any, anything I do right now or anything, any headlines that you see right now is because of my kids. Yeah, I, I have this, um, I just looked to my right in my office and I have this uh, note card that says, 
move with intent, but go with the flow and make sure you always seek and enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think like, when I think about my life, like I hope my kids are like, yeah, dad, like Yogi, he seeked and he enjoyed, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it was, whether like we were picking weeds all morning, trying to teach my son five and a half years old about like the meditative aspect of picking weeds. I don't know if it landed or not, but we picked <laughs> weeds for about an hour. And uh, I think you're right. I think it's kind of fun once you have kids, because I was a loner forever to start thinking that way, because it, I think it kind of naturally happens. And then it's on us to like do the lonely work. Yes. So I, I ask you that, like, have you felt that you as a storyteller now, like you, you got this show based on you, but you're also a writer, you're a producer, you got a lot of talent, you're an actor. Have you felt that like story has become a, a centerpiece in your family when you talk to your kids, your wife, or you talk about the home that you're building? It, it I, like leaps and bounds, yes, a hundred percent, yes, because I actually had an experience with my younger brother years ago that made me open my eyes to how I would raise my kids. Uh, and my, my younger brother, Cameron, uh, he's portrayed in All-American as, as Dylan. Um, he's seven years younger than me, 10 years younger than my older brother. So as you know, growing up, me and my older brother just had a completely different upbringing than my younger brother. By the time he sort of came of age, my parents were divorced. You know, he, he didn't live in the house that me and my brother grew up in. Um, and just had a different, just a different childhood. So, you know, in talking with him and, and reconnecting with him um, uh, outside of just the phone calls and everything, because mind you, during his high school years and, and even college years, I was a pretty much across the country in New York, in Miami and, and Carolina playing. So we didn't have that see you every day type relationship. But once I came back to LA and wanted to reroute re myself in South Central, we had those conversations and it became apparent to me that he only saw the good things that were happening in my life. So when I would talk to him about game planning for certain things or, or how he should look at certain opportunities and whatnot, he was sort of knocked back at me by saying like, it's just easy for you. Like everything comes easy for you. You know, you win the Super Bowl, you play in the NFL, you can, you can live in the New Yorks and the Miamis and the Charlottes and, and have the know dinners and nice cars or whatever and I'm like wow like you really didn't see anything that I went through to get that so in raising my kids that was my number one lesson is bringing them into the process so like you know I try to keep my door open as much as I can when I'm in the office so they can just you know see me on my computer writing or my son likes to likes to bring his little fake computer and type next to me uh, just like literally bringing them into the process so they won't look at me and think that everything came easy, that they see the work that's being done. That's why I keep, you know, a lot of books around, around my house and, and, you know, have open dialogue with my, you know, three and a half year old daughter just to understand her world a little bit better because hopefully when she sees that the stuff that in the work that I'm doing, it will allow her into my process as well. Yeah, so many things went through my brain there. Like one is, you know, when you're an athlete, you're always trained and there's a sign in your facility, whether it was at Oregon or Pitt for me, where it was something along the lines of like, love the process or the way you do yeah. small things is the way you do all things. And I think when you have kids and you're in our profession, um, you get really purposeful with an athletic mind as, as I referenced off the top, like you're always thinking that way. And I, I love that. I, I want to tell you a quick story. I was, um, I'm into meditation, like not crazy, but like intensely, like I, I try mm -hmm. to do it every day. Mm -hmm. And one of the meditation practices I like doing is this one called breath work, where like you would breathe very fast or breathe in a rhythmic pattern and you tap into your subconscious, you basically over oxygenate your brain. And I went into a meditative practice about six months ago before our uh, second kid was born. And I, it was a creative breath work. And in that session, I came up with Makai, that's our baby's name in the breathwork session. But I also, the question I was trying to figure out was how can I be an awesome dad and a badass professional mm -hmm. and, and a great husband? Like, how can I do that? Like what gives, you know, and not, and still like be in shape and be, you know, sharp, <laughs> and, you know, still do what I love. And it came to me like in like, it was like 10 minutes in and it was involve them. So I've taken Zane, who's our five and a half year old, I've taken him to shoots of All-American Story. And he got to meet Leo Rogers, who people listening will get to learn about in episode two, who has one leg. He lost it in a you know very violent uh, motorcycle accident and now is uh, 
you know, seven time paracycling champion. And he doesn't have a prosthetic. Like when he gets groceries, he rides his bike there. And he took his son, his five-year-old son, Junior, to the shoot. So and Junior rode his bike five miles to get there. Yeah. And, and for me, that was like, Zane was so exhausted, like asleep in two seconds in the car. It was 10 <laughs> o'clock when we finished. But every time we watch a rough cut, because he sat on my lap watching every rough cut, he'd be like, that's my guy. I'm a mm-hmm. producer on that. And I'm a camera operator because he held the camera for five minutes. Yeah. And it really made the experience something that uh, I didn't anticipate until last night. Last night, Zane came and we let him stay up late. It's eight o'clock and he's on the floor and he's watching and, and my wife picked up her phone and he grabbed me. He goes, you can't text during the show. <laughs> it was just awesome, man. Like it was, it was a real cool moment for me as a, as a parent. He's, he's already a PA. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He works for free too. He'll work for, he'll work for like uh, a piece of candy or something. Hey, those are the rates. Yeah. So, so for you, I want to ask about a specific moment last night. Um, you talked about your mom. Did she hit you up? After she did, she did. And when she hit me up, I knew it was probably like right when she watched that moment. Uh, and I, that's a moment that I stand by. And I, I say in the show that there, there wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now, even now, um, you know, all American wouldn't be what it was. All American stories wouldn't be what it was. Spencer James wouldn't be, you wouldn't know who Spencer James was if it wasn't for Autumn Basinger. Um, she's just, she's done everything for me that I know of and a ton of other things that I don't know. Uh, it's just, it's just her being her, you know? So when she hit me up, it was, it was a special moment. Cause I was just like, yeah, that was for you. Like that was my way of saying thank you. And I know I can never really say thank you enough to the woman that like got me to this point, but hopefully I can just do it a million times to where she understands it. Yeah. What, what was that? If you don't mind me following up, like what was the dialogue like? I was just a text. It was, it was her saying like, Hey, I, you know, I, I saw the show last night. You did a great job. You know, I love you. Um, and my mom can be very short at times, but me being her son, I know exactly where her heart is in that sense. Um, so I, I know when she watched that moment, like she's, she's sitting at her home, like smiling because she had that moment. And because the world knows that, you know, even with, with all American, um, you know, the character Grace James, you know, they actually talked before the show started. So my mom was able to just pour into her Karima, um, who plays Grace James, just, you know, some of her ideologies, some of how she raised her kids and whatnot. So a lot of what you see in Grace James is actually my mom, Autumn Pacinger. So it was just like, just a bunch of those type of moments that were, that are like, okay, this is another way that I'm telling you, thank you. And hopefully I have another like, million lined up but this is just the latest one that's cool um the listeners probably don't know all of this but uh the executive who greenlit this his name is rick haskins and you know rick he's an awesome guy um Mm -hmm. during production he lost his mom and during production i lost my mom and there was a lot of celebration around your mom um and you being a parent And, and that was on purpose and uh, I'd like to think last night, like I loved hearing what your mom said about you being proud because my mind went to, when we went to bed, I sat up uh, with my wife being like, I wonder what the phone call from my mom would have been like tonight, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm sure Rick, maybe he thought that as well. Um, so it, it was, it's, it's great to hear that reaction. Cause I think my mom would have said the same thing. She would have said like, man, I really like Spencer. I want to, I want to meet him when I come out, you know? Yeah. But I mean, again, she's, she's probably looking down at you smiling smile yeah. everything that you're doing so just know that yeah yeah she uh she saw the rough cut right before we turned it in oh, and okay. uh it was the last meaningful conversation like that she was really aware that we had and uh i remember she looked at me and she gave me this phrase and i don't know if you're like big into this but i'm big into like the words of the year right the my intent bracelets i, I pick one every year i've done it for the last eight years and she goes yogi there's a phrase i want to teach you in hebrew it's uh called tikan olam which means uh, repair the world or heal the world with the world. And she goes, your whole life, you've done that. And this show does it on its, on your, on your best stage of telling stories that'll help people. And, uh, and even before sitting down with you, the first time we met and filmed this, that was the last thing I told myself. And it was the one thing I wrote down prior to leaving my place was like, make this show about that. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you did that. Like you did that. I just had to ask you the questions. The stories did their own thing. So I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing it like you did, man. That was cool. No, it was, that's give and take right there. Cool. Cool. All right. So give and take, um, people don't know this. They're going to see it in episode two, but a lot of Oregon fans are going to listen to this. Um, you almost didn't come back for that season where you guys mentioned the national championship. Can you rehash that story and what went into your decision to return to the Ducks and Chip Kelly to take a run at a natty? Yeah, and this this was a, you know, not a lot of people know about this. I've talked about it just a little bit um, in discussing All-American and just my past. But, you know, going back to, to well, that had to have been 2009, I believe we, we had just lost, 2009-2010 um, season, we had just lost to Ohio State, Terrell Pryor's Ohio State Buckeyes in the Rose Bowl. And for a kid from South Central, Los Angeles, the Rose Bowl is the best bowl game outside of the national championship. I don't want to hear anything about the Orange Bowl or Fiesta or anything like that. It's the Rose Bowl and then everybody else. So losing that game the way we did, uh, you know, having such a great team um, and getting to that point, mind you, my first my first season at Oregon, you know, we lost in the Vegas Bowl. So you fast forward three or four years and we're losing in the, oh yeah, we lost in the Vegas Bowl, but fast forward three or four years, we're, we're losing in the in the Rose Bowl. Obviously you want to win, but just the trajectory of where we ascended to was insane. So I'm sitting there, I, I, I've done a lot of internships at this point. Um, shout out to James Harris. Uh, he was just a monumental figure in my life at Oregon. There's one of my first like true mentors. Um, but I had an opportunity to, to, I already had my degree. I had an opportunity to actually leave school that year early, forego my, my research senior year and work for a company in Portland. I, I would have been fast tracked into, into a management position, overseeing a whole area of Portland in terms of distribution. And by all means, it, it looked like, it, it doesn't look like it was a great opportunity. So I'm sitting there, we just lost the Rose Bowl, I have my degree in hand. You don't really think you're gonna to get to a national championship, but, but like you say it, but you're just like, ah, you know, with bias and everything happening, what are the chances we're actually gonna make it? So I started getting my affairs in order to walk away from the game. I, I told my roommates, I told my, some of my teammates, not all of them, but a few ones that, you know, I, you know were my ride or die friends there. Um, and was I told my coach briefly, like, hey, I'm thinking about this. So they told me, you know, go sit and think about it for a little bit. Um, but in my head, I was packed up, ready to go that off season. I was still doing the, you know, the 630 workouts in winter ball. Um, but I still was keeping my commitment to the team in that aspect. But in the back of my head, I was like, you know, come spring, summertime, I'm out of here. But it's, it took a few weeks, but my friends convinced me, my friends and teammates and, and my two roommates, they convinced me like, listen, we came in together, we have to leave together. Like you can't, you can't just get out of here because you have the opportunity to get out of here. Like at least, you know, come back, finish out strong. That job will still be there when you need it. Uh, and I literally, I jokingly said, all right, if I'm coming back, we at least have to make it to a national championship. And I don't know what happened after that, but we went 12 and 0 and, and landed in the national championship. So I, I, I guess I, I guess I chose right. Totally like a prophet right there, man. Very prophetic of you. Uh, I, I love that. And I think Duck fans are going to love that. Uh, with that said, as a storyteller, like what has the Oregon community been like for you once All American came out and how have they maybe connected with you in a different light now? The Oregon community from, from Coach Cristobal on down. Um, on down to like local fans has been nothing, nothing short of a second home for me. Uh, ever since I left that school, left that campus, I remember the day I, me and my roommate Chad Peppers packed up our U-Haul and, and drove back down to Cali for the final time. Um, but I, I've always known that I can go back there. Uh, the doors have always been open. Guys like Justin Fisher and Mario Cristobal have, have welcomed me back with open arms. I've done stuff with them to help, uh, you know, student athletes there. Uh, and to this day, I'm, I'm actively uh, finding things to work on with them, whether it's helping them in recruiting down here or maybe popping up there and talking with them or talking with the student athletes, going to a game or two. Um, it's just been home, you know, even with All-American coming out. 
they were asking, how can they pub it? How can they push it? How can it get into their networks? Um, I've had, I've had players reach out saying that it's one of their favorite shows. And there's, there's one guy that he's a, he's a, I think he was a DB this year, but I met him. I, I heard about him a couple years ago, but he was, my aunt is a teacher down here in Los Angeles. And apparently growing up, he used to see a lot of Oregon stuff in her classroom. And I'm not saying that's, that's what made him want to go to Oregon, but I like to think that because he saw that signage in her classroom all the time, it probably influenced his chance to go to Oregon. So uh, just little things like that, of, of it being a second home, being somewhere that I know I'm welcomed, that I know I'm loved, and that I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in. Uh, I, I would never turn my back on the Oregon, on the Oregon football community. Yeah, and it's safe to say they wouldn't turn theirs on you. I was texting with their athletic director, Rob Mullins, and just raving about the type of man that you are. And he's like, man, you guys are going to get along. I could see it already. <laughs> and uh, even Coach Kelly, um, I texted him right before we did our shoot of this show, and he obviously ad adores you. And, of course, you know, he got a little credit as an actor uh, yeah. in season two. He made his yeah. way into the show, which I know he was pumped about. Uh, okay, cool. I, I want to, um, you know, finish up here on a couple little notes. Uh, for, for you as a storyteller, like, I, I don't know about you, but I hear from a lot of athletes, especially after last night. And they're like, dude, how'd you get into this? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do you find a good story? How to tell a good story? So for you, like, if you're going to talk to an athlete right now, um, what first and foremost got you into the storytelling profession? Because I'm sure you could have gone down a bunch of different roads. You probably still could go get that job in Portland, man, <laughs> if you want to. Yeah, what, what, what got me into this line of business was just my love for films. Um, I'd watched anything and everything at any time of day. It became therapeutic for me in not only college, but also in the NFL. Whenever it was my off day, I would just go see a new movie in theaters. I, I loved the, the theater experience, grabbing my popcorn and my water and my chocolate raisins and just going and sitting down for, you know, two hours or so. But it was just that. It was getting to a point where I was calling out things that were happening in movies before they were happening, um, you know, breaking down the structure of being like, okay, this is actually the bad guy. I've only seen him for two minutes, but he's going to be the bad guy. And then two hours later, I'm like, Whisper to my wife, I told you he's the bad guy. So it's just things like that that led me to, if I'm, if I'm spending so much time with something, I wanna understand it. I, want, I don't wanna just be a passenger with it. I wanna be able to help drive the ship. So I started reading books about storytelling. Some of these books right here are, most of them probably about storytelling and, and story structure, but started reading books about story design. Um, I downloaded Final Draft Rider out of nowhere and just started like understanding just the formatting of it. Started reading um, reading movie scripts after I would watch that movie. That became a big hobby of mine was if I'd watch a movie, I'd have to find the script or a version of the script and then and just read it to see how certain things were placed or written in the script. Um, and then that just led me to, you know, little by little getting better at understanding story. Um, to the point, you know, now we're going into season three of All-American and I'm developing other concepts, but it all started with just this little hobby that got me away from being in my head with football, just allowing me to escape. Yeah, I think that's, that's amazing. Um, I remember talking to a, a guy named Michael Gervais, who's high performance psychologist for the Seahawks. Just, you'd love this guy. Uh, we gotta make sure we get you on his podcast. And he, we were talking um, one day and he goes, well, what do you, what do you do every day? What do you drink every day? What do you eat every day? Where do you walk every day? And it was like that conscious effort to be like, this is what I do. This is where I lean. What am I reading? Oh, I'm reading a lot of like sports sections. Or I'm, re I'm watching a lot of sports docs. Like maybe I should dig a little bit deeper. And I think yeah. uh, what I'm hearing you say is like that red thread was like sitting in a theater was pretty cool. And you kept pulling on it. And now here you are putting things in the theater for well, the proverbial theater for people to see. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I did a I did a quick trip to Arizona, uh, sort of the middle of last year uh, to visit my brother and his family and the theaters were open. And I was like, I haven't been in a movie theater in six months. I, I, I got to go. So I actually went and saw uh, Tenet for the first time in theaters. There were maybe four people in the entire theater, but sitting down in that theater with my popcorn and my water and my chocolate raisins for the first time in six months. Mind you, again, it's part of my relationship with my wife, like part of my marriage. Like 
I have to go see one or two movies a week. So this has been killing me that we haven't been in theaters, but sitting down in that theater and seeing that big screen come up, it literally like was a euphoric experience. And I knew I was like, this is, this just reaffirms why I'm in this business because of this feeling that I have right here. So true. I, uh, I did a film on uh, it's, you can see it behind me. It's called life in a walk. Hmm. And it's the first thing I ever directed. And I remember sitting at the film festival in Orange County that it was the first one we got into and watching it on a big screen. Yeah. And it was like, it, it was such a different experience. Yeah. And like, you're like, there's still something to it. I know we can watch everything in our house, et cetera, but you're right on that. Uh, so, so with that said, uh, what makes a good story? Ooh, what makes a good story? A, a good story is for me at least being able to, to understand the rules of the world that they're presenting to you. Uh, because mind you, when you're writing a film, you can, you can create any rules, as long as they make sense in my opinion, as long as they make sense in the world that you created, as well as the protagonist or antagonist, however you may be, as long as they have, as long as they're rooted in who they are and we get to see their trajectory change throughout the film. Uh, that's to me, that's the writer's journey. You know, that's the hero's journey. That's starting from one place and then at the end of the film, growing to another place, whether positively or negatively. But if the world is built out, because I'm somebody that it could be a great story. The protagonist could be three time, four time Oscar winner, whatever. But outside of the film, I start asking questions about the world. So, you know, that's why I'm, that's why I'm so big on Christopher Nolan, because so much of the discussion about his films aren't even on screen. It's, well, what would happen if this happens? What would happen if that happens? And I feel like if you're able to write a story and it allows, it, it evokes questions about the world that you built within that story, that's a good film in my book. Whether, it's, whether the film is actually good or bad, that's a good film in my book. Like I, I just watched Interstellar again for the, for the umpteenth time, 10 years after its release. And I'm still like, hmm, what does, what does this actually mean, you know? And I, it's just the world building is, to me, is what makes a great story. Interstellar. I cried so hard watching that movie. <laughs> does it, did, did you? And did it get you like 10 years later still? Like you maybe did the first time? You understand the stakes. Because mind you, when I saw it for the first time, I'm in college. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a knucklehead in college, not knowing if I'm going to be on a football team or not. But then you fast forward 10 years and you realize like, oh, this whole, this guy's whole journey is to get back to his kids, get back to his two kids. Now I have two kids and I'm like, I understand it so much more deeper now because of that aspect. And I feel like when you, when you sit with a, when you have a good film that you can sit with and you can almost grow into like a good pair of shoes or, or, or a nice suit or whatever, it's, it just makes it that much better. Yeah, that's, that's well said. My favorite book is The Alchemist. And I try to read it every year and it's always a different experience. I'm always like, oh, I miss that moment. And like my book is highlighted, written. <laughs> it's probably like, who knows what's in the, in between those pages, but that, that's really well said. And, and I think too, tell me if, if you agree with this, but as an athlete, I've always felt that every season is a story, right? And you either are mortal or immortal. Like one mm -hmm. of the two happens, like Alabama remains the only team that did not die proverbially this mm -hmm. past college football season, right? Everybody else did. And I think there's something as athletes that like we, we're, we're constantly living multiple characters. We're constantly living different story arcs. We're constantly living in, as you said, a, a world that is shaped by the head coach and the facility uh, that is different than a lot of different people's worlds. And I think, you know, for me in locker rooms, I always ask guys the same question, which is how many of you think you're a storyteller? Maybe one hand out of 105 players gets risen every time I've done this. Mm -hmm. I've done this, you know, countless times in, in the Pac-12. And then I say, well, how many have Instagram? How many have TikTok? How many have Twitter? I'm like, you're yeah. always telling a story. Like your world is being shaped in 160, 180 characters, whatever it is. And I think once we recognize that, like a light bulb can go off and be like, oh, all right, now let me really tell what I'm about and represent my name, image, and likeness if we want to talk about present day college athlete. Yeah. Um, and or take that into a professional career. I'm wondering if, if it hit you similarly. In terms of in terms of understanding if I was a storyteller back then? Yeah. 
Yeah. Or even like, as you got going, we were like, yeah, like there's a story about Spencer Basinger as a linebacker at Oregon that somebody else is writing. There's a story in the New York Giants that somebody else is writing. Like, <laughs> when am I going to pen this bad boy? I don't think it ever hit me like that until the idea of it became real. Um, it was something that I was just writing stories that I hadn't seen on, on screen before. I didn't see myself as a storyteller. By all means, it, you know, writing was just a hobby of mine, much like, well, you know, collecting baseball cards or going fishing on an off day. Like it was just a, a pastime for me. So by the time it became an idea of like, hey, this can actually not only be a show, but be like a, a you know, a hit show on two separate platforms. That's when it was like, oh, I think, I think we're actually like onto something here, you know? Um, because at the end of the day, nobody, nobody spends their, their life wondering if it's movie worthy. I don't, I don't, I wasn't asking myself that question when I was going through those experiences growing up. It only, once I got past those things is when I went back and was like, well, let me see how I can turn my life into sort of a cinematic experience. And, and even now I've, I've thought about writing a book. I've thought about, um, what would, what would another iteration of an all American look like, or, or what, what would a version of my life now in terms of a story look like on TV? Be you say, you know, we end all American at a certain point and we pick up and now Spencer's an adult with a family now and making a TV show about himself. Like now we're getting into inception, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'd never, I'm early on. I never saw myself as a storyteller until the opportunity presented itself. And then I was like, okay, this is where we at. I'm diving headfirst into it. Yeah, I love that, man. Well, I'm glad you did, right? As I said it to you last night on our show, uh, without you sharing your story, we don't have a show to share, which uh, I'm super grateful for and thankful for. And uh, I appreciate the time, man. I know I know you're really busy. Uh, with that said, your show, All American, uh, you're a producer of and actor in, uh, and of course is based on you. That comes out on the 18th. What are you most looking forward to in season three? Oh, what am I looking forward to? I, I think for people to for people to understand that Spencer James is just still a kid at the end of the day. Um, was season two did so well, and I, I had such a, a warm response to it that again it, it felt like they wanted the story to just just end right there or fast forward in a sense. Like I've had a lot of people. When is he getting to college? When is he getting to the NFL? I'm like. At the end of the day, Spencer James is just again a 17-year-old kid just trying to figure it out like everybody else. So I think we're gonna we're gonna dive a lot into him coming back home now, understanding now that this place isn't what it was when he left. So now he has to understand these new relationships. Meanwhile, still keeping friendships alive and well in Beverly Hills. So we're we're gonna touch on a lot of different things, you know, you know, the mental health aspect of it, um, a lot of the, a lot of current issues that are prevalent in our world today. We're gonna to hit on in our own unique way. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's Spencer James just understanding that he's a young black kid in this world, just trying to find his footing. Yeah, I cannot wait to watch it. Um, I definitely binged it on Netflix for sure. So if anybody wants to ramp up prior to this bad boy <laughs> premiere in season three, I'd highly recommend doing that. And then you can catch it on the CW and of course the CW apps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all right, Spencer, I appreciate the time, man. Uh, I'm really thankful. I think this is just the beginning of a really cool journey for us as, as friends and hopefully as storyteller collaborators um, and of course, Pac-12 football fans. So uh, we got to get you on the Pac-12 Networks, man. We'll make sure we, we make that happen at some time. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, whenever you, whenever you call, I'm picking up. So it's just the beginning for us. I love it. All right. That's Spencer Pacinger. I'm Yogi Roth. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, as always, subscribe to the newsletter, uh, yogiroth.com. We'll kick out this show, details about this show, and, of course, all things you need to know in Pac-12 football. All right, man. I appreciate you. Much love. Peace. Yeah, I'll talk to you.